thank you so much, Rosie, and thank you to Daisy and Alex and to Five by Fifteen for having me this evening. It's uh, it's quite surreal to be giving a Five by Fifteen myself. I've watched so many of them over the years and have been involved with things sort of on the other side. So it really is a unique pleasure to be to be here. Um, I'm going to talk this evening about the history of a place, as Rosie said, called Fire Island, and that history offers us a story, I think, about fantasy, about the stakes of fantasy, and about the relationship between myth and, and reality. So for those of you that don't know much about it, Fire Island is a long, thin barrier island just off the coast of Long Island in New York. If you look at on a map, it sort of is like a sandbar. It's very long and thin. Um, and it's located just off the south shore of Long Island. So it's right there on the fringes of the Atlantic. It feels when you're on it like you're sort of at the end of the world. But it's also only a couple of hours away from Manhattan. So it has this really particular quality of feeling very remote in one way, you know, a world away from the hustle and bustle of the city, uh, but also being quite accessible. You can take a train to Brooklyn and from Brooklyn to Long Island and a ferry and it takes a couple of hours. Um, so it really is primed sort of topographically, geographically as a desirable location for New Yorkers to go on their summer holidays. So Fire Island, as we know it today, dates back to the 19th century. Um, and really, it's it sort of coincides with the summer holiday and the development of a summer holiday as a sort of regular fixture in middle class urban life. Um, and the search for somewhere to enjoy the benefits of clean air and, and water and to escape the dirt and disease of the city made it uh, you know, a very in-demand location. So today, across, across the length of it, there are approximately... 17 or so communities and these are mostly seasonal communities so fire island really comes alive during the summer um, between may and september that's when people who own houses on the island perhaps their second homes will will, will open their houses in may and close them around now actually in sort of the end of September early October mid-October um, but there are also you know big groups of single people and friends who might rent shares in a house which will entitle them to so many weekends and there are also of course day trippers from the city and further afield there aren't many people who live year round on fire island 200 or so um you have to be quite hardy to live there in the winter in the colder months it's freezing of course um and quite inhospitable it's hard to get water across from the mainland because the pipes underneath the bay freeze over so it really is a summer place and throughout the 20th century fire island has been synonymous really with two particular communities. When people outside of the New York area talk about Fire Island, they're probably referring to these two places. And they are communities that are roughly in the middle of the island and they are perhaps the most famous, I would even go as far to say infamous. Um, and they are the two communities known as offering a kind of queer haven. And they have done throughout the 20th century, they've offered a cultural hub and a safe space for members of the LGBTQ plus community from the city. So the first of these is a place called Cherry Grove. And in the early 20th century, Cherry Grove was known among families from Long Island as a sort of rustic outpost. Uh, there were you know, only a few houses and it was mostly occupied by those families. It was very traditional in lots of ways. And it was in the late 1930s that gay men and women who worked in show business or in the cultural industries in the city discovered the cheap rents that were available there and uh, started to make their summer home in this place. Things were fairly harmonious, but there were there were tensions between these two sects of the island community. The family people called these these sort of urban invaders the theatre people, which feels like a euphemism that we don't have to sort of use our imaginations to imagine what, what they mean by that exactly. Um, and you can still feel that that quality in the place today, that it has a reputation as somewhere that's outrageous and zany and sort of bucks the trend. So it's known as a place, um, it's associated with drag shows and with a thriving theatrical culture. Um, when you step off the ferry there today, you can expect to see huge rainbow flags and fairy lights, drag queens, go-go dancers. So that's in a nutshell what Tre Cherry Grove feels like as a place. The other community to the east is a place known as Fire Island Pines. And this was developed in the 1950s, again, as a, as a sort of family friendly community. 
although that aim wasn't really borne out for very long. So the Pines offers a slightly sleeker, more expensive alternative to Cherry Grove. Um, if you think of the Pines, you think of Calvin Klein models, even Calvin Klein himself, he spent a lot of time there. And sort of grand modernist homes that look out onto the ocean with these you know, imposing Atlantic views. It was known even going into the 1970s in the sort of post Stonewall boom of gay liberation, it was still a more discreet option. It was a place for gay men who didn't want to be outed by their choice of destination, summer holiday destination to go. Uh, you could kind of hide away behind the glitziness of the pines. Uh, although it would in the 1970s gain its reputation as this really hedonistic, absolutely buzzing space. And in some ways, the home of disco music. Many of the big disco DJs from the city refined their craft there, mixing together songs, creating extended mixes and, and mixtapes. And this is the thing about Fire Island, that it would be easy just to see it on the surface as this kind of um, hedonistic, glamorous place. Uh, but actually, it has a very long and illustrious history. There have been so many artists and writers who visited. I could spend my 15 minutes just reeling off a list of those names, but I won't do that. But you know, people like James Baldwin have spent time there, writers like Patricia Highsmith, um, artists, singers and artists like Patti Smith, Robert Maplethorpe, David Hockney, Derek Jarman visited from London in the 1970s. There's a really, really long list of people who've spent weeks there, weekends there, and have something to say about it, have recorded it in their diaries. And I'm sure there are many more um, that we don't actually perhaps know about or that are harder to trace. Big showbiz figures like Madonna have been, you know, known to, to appear on Fire Island as if out of nowhere. Lady Gaga performed there just as she was on the brink of international fame in 2008. And Liza Minnelli also visited. Um, and that was known by sort of the locals as a kind of papal visit. People, people ran to the boardwalk to watch her get off the boat. Um, I only knew about some of this the first time that I went to Fire Island. That was in the summer of 2017, so it was just over five years ago. And I was in my mid-20s and I was living in New York at the time and I was working on my PhD project then about queer American poets and in particular how poets conceptualise the city as a space of intimacy. And I knew that the poet Frank O'Hara, who was you know, featured in my thesis and is still today my, my favourite poet, I knew that O'Hara had died after being involved in a fatal dune buggy accident on Fire Island in the 1960s. So I'd gone there in July 2017 with a friend who was visiting New York, and we began our evening in Cherry Grove, and it really did feel like a magical place. We arrived at one of the bars along the oceanfront and there was a drag queen performing a lip sync to Sweet Dreams Are Made Of This. You couldn't make it up. It was one of those slightly stranger than fiction moments where the lyrics felt so apt. It was almost too on the nose. And it was deeply moving to be around other queer people, to feel entirely safe and to feel that actually the, the, the potential for judgment or you know, homophobic hostility had just been parked at the ferry dock. And we were somewhere that was created for people who share an affinity. Um, after, after our trip to Cherry Grove, we moved further along, east along the island on the beach, going towards the Pines. I was looking to retrace the footsteps there of Frank O'Hara, who had composed elegies to James Dean on the beach there in the 1950s, some years before he would be involved in this fatal accident on the same beach, the same strip of sand in 1966. O'Hara had scrawled James Dean's name into the sand when he was writing these poems, and I was there to do the same. It felt like a slightly sort of morbid ritual, I suppose. So I was scrawling his name in the sand with my toe and looking out at the Atlantic, and I was reading from his poems too. And there was a line from his poem, Ode to Joy, that really resonated in that moment. We shall have everything we want and there'll be no more dying. On the surface, it felt like Fire Island was exactly this kind of bountiful utopia where we can have everything we desire. It's a place where people have gone over the years in search of solace and safety and sexual freedom, freedom from violence and judgment. But it's also a haunted place, a place that knows death all too well. And I'm thinking not just of the ghosts of writers like O'Hara, who had 
actually died on or around Fire Island. But of course, the many gay men who had died from illnesses related to AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s. And that epidemic really decimated the communities of Cherry Grove and the Pines. The beach parties that that made the Pines famous in the 70s still continued into this period, but it also became a funereal place. People would go there to scatter their ashes, the ashes of their lovers and friends. It felt to me in that moment like a haunted place and it sparked, I guess, an obsession. Um, an obsession with a place that was quite hard to get a handle upon and felt unlike anywhere I'd ever been before. That's what made me want to write a book about this place. And I found my hunch about its hauntedness affirmed in its literary history. I found a poem by W.H. Auden, who had briefly owned a house on Fire Island with friends in the late 1940s. And he wrote, this poem was called Pleasure Island, and Auden felt very ambivalent about pleasure. It's a slightly ironic title. But he wrote, it's as if the lenient, amusing shore knows in fact about all the dyings. It was almost eerie to read this line long before the ravages of the epidemic, finding in this textual history the sense of foreboding, the feeling that the landscape of the island itself might be sentient itself or timeless, kind of aware of the lives that were being lived there and the lives that it had claimed. Auden was rather ambivalent about Fire Island as a place, as I suggested. There are photos of him enjoying his kind of idyllic life there, um, a writer on retreat. But in reality, his literary celebrity from the city followed him there. He was often accosted by people in bars who wanted them to read, uh, wanted him to read their poems or their, their novel manuscripts and things like that. Um, it was a chaotic time in his life. There were drunken conflicts with his lovers. He was extremely self-conscious about his body. And so, the evidence that we have of his experience there feels disjointed from these images that feel idealized in some way. And this disjoint feels important. I think it captures something central about Fire Island as a place. There are all kinds of charming untruths and counterfactual moments in the island's history. These moments where myth and reality don't seem to meet up. I so want to believe, as local law suggests, that Oscar Wilde visited Cherry Grove in the 1880s during his American lecture tour. But there's no primary evidence that suggests that's true. So we're left instead with the question as to why this myth endures and why it matters. I think there's something about that image of, you know, Wilde, the aesthete, sort of christening the island shores like a gay, flamboyant patron saint that feels too appealing to ignore entirely. And while the myth of Fire Island offers a sort of idealised projection of the good life, and it's a common location on Instagram, and that's surely no accident here, I think, the reality is often far more complex. Many of the people that I interviewed for my book have been going to Fire Island for decades. They've made it their home. It's their happy place, their safe place. But they're also very aware of its problems. A place that might seem like a utopia to some has often been anything but and a paradise that's inclusive only to a certain extent. It's been inhabited mostly through its history by white, affluent, cisgendered, able-bodied queer people. And there are important conversations today that are seeking to you know, help, help um, progress the island's communities and make them more inclusive. So utopia is a complex idea. It's both real and abstract, it describes a place, but also an idea of a place. Fire Island's shortcomings as a utopia are self-evident, but I think its value is as a place that offers us an imperfect vision of paradise, which can tell us about ourselves and our desires. It's not just reality, after all, that informs our vision of the future. It's the radical ideals that we find forged in fantasies, fantasies of a place where all of us have everything we want and there'll be no more dying. Thank you for listening.